Right, good afternoon everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name's Catherine. I work here in the Department of Physics at Oxford University. I'm part of the Quantum Materials Group. And we're going to talk to you today, I'm going to talk to you today, about these. Who can tell me what this is? Magnets. On the count of three, one, two, three. Magnets. Yeah, well done, brilliant. Okay, so I reckon you probably all know a thing or two about magnets. So I am going to give you 15 seconds to talk to the people next to you, tell each other what you already know about magnets, okay? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Shh. Okay. Hands up with suggestions for what you just told each other about magnets. Person in the red top, near the top. Yep. Um, if you put the blue side and the blue side together, it won't be flat. If you put the blue end and the blue end, we call the ends of magnets poles. If you put the blue end and the blue end together, they repel. If you put a red end and the red end together, they repel. If you put a red end next to a blue end, they attract. Okay, who can tell me something else? Black top near the end, yep. Um, so if you can magnetize a pin in the keyboard, then you make yourself really compasses. We will come back to that excellent thought about compasses, needles, and magnets in just a minute. Anyone else? What can you? What is? What is magnetic? Can anyone tell me what things are magnetic? Yep. Metal. metal. Are all metals magnetic? No. no. Some metals are magnetic. Can anyone name me a magnetic metal? Yep. Cobalt. Cobalt. Very nice answer. That was the one I was expecting for number three. <laughs> cobalt. We have got some cobalt here. You might not have seen cobalt before. Cobalt's actually slightly nasty stuff. Um, it can be an irritant, it's a bit toxic, so we're going to have to be careful. What I've got here is a fairly strong magnet on a stick, which is going to help me out with a few of today's demos. This here, this is cobalt, and I'm going to stick it to the magnet so I don't have to touch it. That is what cobalt looks like. So I'm going to put it under here so that everyone can see it. That's cobalt. Okay, so cobalt... Cobalt is one of three magnetic metals. Can anyone name one of the other two? On the end, yep. Copper. Copper. Copper is not magnetic. So let's try again. Yep. Nickel. Nickel. Nickel is magnetic. This here. Who reckons they've seen nickel before? A few of you. You've probably all seen nickel before. Nickel is used to coat lots of other different metals. This is a five pence piece. This is stainless steel covered in nickel. And you might find... Um, you also get jewellery that's coated in nickel. Um, five pence pieces are magnetic, which is very nice. Um, so you've probably all seen nickel before, you just might not have noticed it. You probably haven't seen a piece of nickel like this. This is 99.52% pure nickel, and it sticks to our magnet very nicely indeed. So that's nickel. So we've had cobalt, we've had nickel. Number three? Yep. Bronze. Nope, not bronze. Yep. Iron, exactly. Here's my piece of iron. Got a little piece of iron, does exactly the same, sticks to our magnet. Now in school, that's all they're going to tell you about. They're going to tell you about iron, they're going to tell you about nickel, they're going to tell you about cobalt. Actually, there's way more to magnetism than that. There's way more stuff that is magnetic that they never tell you about. This lovely blue crystal here, these little rocks here. Actually, you know what? All of you are magnetic. Even the air you are breathing today is magnetic. In the next hour, I'm going to show you all of that and more. But we're going to start with these little rocks. And we're going to start with a little history of magnet, magnetism. So this lump of rock here, it uh, has a very, very apt name. This piece of rock is called magnetite. Um, it comes from a place called magnesia in Greece, 
um, magnesium, magnetite, magnet, you can see the connection. It is, perhaps unsurprisingly, magnetic. It will stick to my magnet quite nicely. So that's magnetite. Magnetite is fairly interesting, but actually, these little rocks here, these are called lodestones, and these are natural magnets. And we can tell they're magnets because what they can do is they can pick up paper clips. So they are natural magnets. You dig them out of the ground, and they're already magnetic. That's a, a lodestone. And we've been using lodestones for quite a long time. When I say quite a long time, I mean thousands of years. And I'm going to bring my camera with me, if we can, over to here, where I've got something that's really rather beautiful, I think. This here is an ancient Chinese compass. Which direction does the compass point? North. Uh, this one doesn't. This one points south, just just cause. So if we bring it away from our table with all of our bits of metal and magnets on it, then what we should find, who knows which way north is? Can everyone point north? Which way do you reckon is north? Grown-ups, children, everyone at the same time? We've got, we've got some differences of opinion here, haven't we? I can tell you categorically north is that way. Which is why my lovely south pointing compass is pointing that way. And it points using this, this little piece here. This is a piece of lodestone that's been carved into a spoon shape, a ladle shape. And this long handle here points south because it is magnetic. It's a compass. What, what is a compass when it comes down to it? You've probably all seen something like this before, an orienteering compass. Tell you what, let's make a compass. We've already heard a little bit about how we might do that. Can I have a volunteer to help me make a compass? Yep, in the blue jumper. Do you want to come on down? Yep. Let's give a little round of applause. <laughs> My name's Catherine. What's your name? Teddy. Teddy, excellent. Teddy, right, I want you to come over here. Here. You've got everything you need. On this table in front of you, you've got everything you need to make a compass. I want you to have a go. So what you're holding there is actually some very strong magnets. Okay. They don't look a whole lot like magnets, but they are. They're neodymium magnets. Mm -hmm. What might you do with those? So if we look at our compass over here, we can see that our compass over here has got an arrow. Yeah. So we're going to need the arrow. How are we going to connect the magnets and the arrow? How about we just put the magnets into the arrow? Yeah, there we go. And then what are we going to do? Put it in the water. And let's see what happens. So which way is north? That way. Yeah, there we go. Very well done, Teddy. Thank you very much. Can we have a little round of applause? And just to prove that that wasn't set up, if I flip it back around to point the other way, what we will find is it knows exactly where it wants to go. So what's going on there? So this is a magnet. Why is it moving? What's happening? Yeah? The Earth is a magnet. The Earth is a magnet. Exactly right. So it's as though the Earth has got a giant bar magnet inside it. And one magnet, as we were saying, magnets can attract and repel each other. So the magnet that is the Earth is interacting with the magnet that is the compass, and one is making the other move. So that's exactly what's going on in our compass. We've got one magnet making another magnet move. Now, we said that this ancient Chinese compass it is, well, this one isn't ancient. This one's a replica. But the original is ancient. It's thousands of years old. We've been using magnets for thousands of years. But we haven't understood them for very long at all. It was actually only in about 160 years ago that we started to have any idea what was going on in any of this stuff. Uh, and that was through the experiments of a scientist called Ersted, Hans Christian Ersted. 
Um, he worked in Copenhagen in about the 1860s, and we're going to do one of his most interesting experiments here now. Can I have a volunteer to come and help me be Ersted? Let's go for someone. Yep, in the white top. Yep, Joanna, come on down. Thank you very much. A little round of applause. My name's Catherine. What's your name? Maya. Maya. Right, Maya, you are going to be Ersted. Can I ask you to stand just there? Now, what I've got here is, well, you tell me, what are these? Magnets. They're not magnets. That was the other question. Yeah, in the middle? Batteries. Batteries, exactly. So I've got two AA batteries, and I've got some slightly tangled wire, but that's all right. Is this a circuit? No. No, it's not. Why is it not a circuit? Yep. Exactly. It's not connected. There's a gap in the middle, quite an obvious gap between one end and another. Right, Mia, can I ask you to stand a little bit further forwards for me? And I'm going to be standing behind you, but I'm going to give you this piece of wire. Okay. There we go. Right. Okay. I want you to hold that piece of wire just a bit in front of you. Yep, that is fine. And I'm going to stand behind you, and I'm going to connect the circuit, okay? I'm going to connect the circuit by connecting this bit here to this bit here. And that will complete the circuit. What will happen when the circuit is completed? Where's the electricity going to go? Oh. Yep. It's going to go around the wires. That's exactly right. So it's going to come out the batteries. It's going to go around the wires. It's going to go across in front of Mia here. And it's going to come back into the batteries. So actually, we're short-circuiting the batteries here. So we are going to be very careful. And we don't recommend trying this at home. But we're going to be all right. OK, so when I connect it, Mia, are you able to shout for me? Yeah. yeah. Do you reckon you can shout the word now? Okay. When you think I've connected it, I want you to shout the word now. Yeah? Okay. okay. And everyone else, you're going to be able to see when I connect it. So let's see if she gets it right. Now. That was quite a long time after I'd connected it. But that's all right. That's all right. You're not supposed to be able to see electricity. So that's perfectly normal. So, I'm going to pop that there, and I'm going to go and get you a tool. I'm going to get you one of these. So, this was, this was what Ersted noticed. I'm going to ask you to hold that. Right, can you hold the compass there? Yes. And I want you to lie the wire across the top of the compass. Right across the needle. Perfect. And I'm going to grab the other end of it. Same thing again. When you think I connect it, I want you to shout the word now. Okay? Now. There we go. Right, I'm going to do it again. Now. Okay, so what can you see? The needle's turning. The needle's turning. Let's show everyone else. The door. Yep, exactly. Right, I want you to pop the compass up on the corner of the table here, and we're going to go and get the camera so that we can show everyone exactly what is going on. Okay, we all lined up nicely there. And then if we put that on there, yeah, that'll do. And then, where's the other end of our wire? Here we go. Okay, we're going to connect it in one, two, three. There you go. Okay, one, two, three. There we go. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mia. Congratulations on successfully completing Ersted's experiment. A little round of applause. <laughs> So, what was going on there? Something a bit fishy was going on there. We said with our compass, what's happening is that one magnet, the Earth, is interacting with another one, our compass needle. So what must be happening here? Something is interacting with our compass needle. Well, maybe we're making a magnet. Maybe, actually, electricity creates magnetism. You know what it does. What is electricity made of? If you look really closely at electricity, what is it made of? Yep. Yeah. Not quite, no. I'm looking for the name of a particle. Yep. Yeah. Electrons. electrons. Okay, so electricity is made of electrons. Electrons are these little tiny particles, and these little electrons go whizzing down our wire. 
Okay, so we've got electrons going down our wire. When the electrons go down the wire, they make a little bit of magnetism. Okay, so this is an important idea, which is why I'm saying it again and again and again. Moving electrons make magnetism. Hold on to that thought, because we're going to need it again a little bit later. So, what we saw in Oersted's experiment was that a little bit of electricity makes a little bit of magnetism. What if, with a little bit of electricity, instead of using just one wire, what if we use lots and lots and lots of wires? Well, we can do that quite easily with what I've got here. This is what's known as an electromagnet. And inside it, in here, we don't just have one wire going round. We have a piece of wire that goes round and round and round and round hundreds of times. So when I connect it, you can see at the moment it's not connected. When I connect it, the electricity goes from the battery, goes through the wire, and again, it goes back into the battery. So we're going to be careful with this one. But now we've got lots of wires. So we've got lots of little bits of magnetism all adding up. So, just to prove it, when I plug it in, what we find is that I have created a magnet, because I can pick up paper clips. Very nice, but not very impressive. We should be able to do a little bit more with our magnet than that, especially one this big. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to stick, this is just a lump of iron, it's a nice painted black lump of iron, I'm going to stick it on the end, something like that. Now, have we got anyone in the front row who's feeling strong? Yeah? Right. I want you to see. You hold that. I'll hold this. What happens when you pull? Any good? Nope, nothing. Anyone else? Go on, have a go. Nope, no give. Right, I think we're going to need more people. I think we need four volunteers for this one. I think, near the top in the pink. Yep, do you want to come down? Uh, in the stripy top, just here. Um, have we got it, pink top with glasses? Yep. And stripy top here. Do you want to come on down? Right, I want two of you on this side. Okay, that was for you, that is for you. And then you guys on this side. I'm going to give this one to you. Right, I want you to hold that, hold it a little bit nearer the end. There you go. Hang on to the rope, not the clips. There we go. OK, right. I'm going to stay here to make sure it doesn't go horribly wrong. Do you want to move forwards just a little bit? Do you want to move forwards just a little bit towards everyone else? Right, OK, on your marks. When I say stop, I mean stop, OK? Because we've got to be careful here. On your marks, get set, go. Come on, you can do it. It's just two batteries. Come on. How much electricity have we got here? What's the voltage of a battery? Does anyone know? One and a half. So we've got two batteries. So how many volts have we got? Three volts. Come on, guys. You can beat three volts, surely. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, well, never mind. Do you want to stop there? Thank you all very much. Do you want to sit back down? So there we go. Three volts. That's all we've got here. Three volts. But if I unplug it, easy as pie. Three volts of electricity making a huge amount of magnetism there, more magnetism than you lot could cope with. We can get bigger than that, though. In fact, it's one of the things we do here. This is a research-type magnet. So this is a magnet that we use for making a very, very big magnetic field. So everything that we're dealing with at the moment is called electromagnetism. We're using electricity to create magnetism. Um, and in this case, we do use quite a lot of electricity to create quite a lot of magnetism. So we said we used about three volts for this, this little electromagnet here. This one that we use for our research, well, obviously, we don't use this precise one for our research. This is three quarters of a magnet, as you can see. We, use, we have a very nice, that's our nice, shiny research magnet. It's very pretty. And it's the same idea. The electricity goes in one side, goes round and round and round. These are copper coils, copper wires, fat copper wires here. And then it comes back out the other pole. We don't use three volts for this one. 
we use about 15,000 volts. And we put it all through it in 10 milliseconds. So it's a huge amount of electricity going through it incredibly quickly, and that makes an absolutely enormous magnetic field. So if you go to a scrapyard, scrapyards um, that sort of crush cars, that kind of thing, you'll often see they'll have an electromagnet that will go in and will pick up a car and move a car or that kind of thing. So that, that might usually pick up about, be about one Tesla of magnetic field, something along those lines. Um, this one, this is more like 40 Tesla. And with any luck, we're going to get this one, this lovely one here, to go up to about 70 Tesla. So this is absolutely enormous. If you've ever had an MRI scan, MRI machines are usually one and a half, maybe three Tesla at a push. So this is absolutely huge. And like I said, you do it all incredibly quickly in about 10 milliseconds. So that's the blink of an eye. And we create some of the strongest magnetic fields. Well, here we create some of the strongest magnetic fields in Europe. But actually, we can use this same method. This is called pulsed field magnets, because you put lots of field in one place at the same time with one big jolt of electricity. We can do that and make really, really big magnetic fields. So this is from a group in Japan. Um, and well, actually, I'm just going to show you. So that's what happens when they run their magnet. Should we see it again? Just because I think it's great. So they're going to put all of this electricity through. And it's such a strong magnetic field that actually the magnet blows itself up. And that, that was 1,200 Tesla. So that's, an, that's a mind-bendingly strong magnetic field. That's the strongest magnetic field anyone has ever created indoors point blank, which is absolutely amazing. So we scientists, we people, we understand how to make these enormous magnetic fields. We can make the strongest magnetic fields in the world. But we haven't actually really understood everything there is to know about magnetism. Because all of these have an important difference to this. Are there any batteries in our bar magnet? No. If you've got a fridge at home and you want to stick a fridge magnet on it, do you have to switch on the fridge magnet? Do you have to plug in the fridge magnet to get it to work? No. So we're getting there. We're starting to understand electromagnetism. But there's something else at play here. And actually, it took us a lot longer to understand what was going on in these bar magnets. It needed a whole new theory of physics. That new theory is called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics describes the very smallest things in the world, including our little electrons. Electrons are described by quantum mechanics. Now, what is everything around us made of? Yeah? Atoms. Excellent answer. Uh, who knows what these are? Yep. Glow sticks. glow sticks, exactly. Who knows how to make glow sticks work? Yeah, excellent. I'm just going to give them to you three there. Can you get those glow sticks working for me? Quick as you can. Right, so we've said that everything is made of atoms. What's in the center of an atom? Yeah? The nucleus. The nucleus is in the center of the atom. This is my nucleus here. Can I have a glow stick? And what do we have going around our nucleus? Yeah? Someone else? Yeah? Electrons. So we have a nucleus in the middle. We have electrons. Thank you very much. We have electrons whizzing around the outside. And what did we say about moving electrons? Remember, we had, we've already had these, these glowing electrons, haven't we? What did we say that moving electrons create? Yeah? Moving electrons create magnetism. 
So we've got electrons whizzing around our atom, creating a tiny little bit of atomic magnetism. And that is what explains all of the rest of the stuff that we see. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do it. We're going to live it. We're going to be it. We're going to be a lump of iron. OK. Each of you is going to be an atom. Each of you is going to be an iron atom. And to do that, you will need to get out the arrows that you should have, should have been on your desk when you started. Is there anyone who hasn't got an atom? Uh, hasn't got an arrow? You haven't got arrows. There's probably some spares up on the side if you want to just sneak, sneak up and get some spares. Okay, so. So you are now, each of you is an iron atom, okay? And your arrow, your arrow represents kind of like a little tiny bar magnet. And your little arrow, your quite big arrow, can either point in one of two directions. It can either point up or it can point down, okay? Nothing in between. It can't point sideways, can't point forwards or backwards. It's got to be either up or down. OK. I want everyone to point their arrow either up or down. OK, very nice. That's fine. Now, for the next bit, I want you to do the next bit in silence. Can we manage that? Silence means no talking at all, not even whispering to the people next to you. Okay. I want you to have your arrow pointing in the same direction as all the people around you. Okay. No talking. Line your arrow up with the people either side of you, in front of you, behind you. Okay. How are we doing? We are doing really very nicely there. Excellent. Congratulations, everyone. You have successfully magnetized a piece of iron. Each one of you is an iron atom, and you're now all pointing in the same direction. In fact, on a count of three, I want you to shout out what direction you're pointing, OK? One, two, three. Up. Uh -huh. Yeah, a nice resounding shout of up there. Everyone is pointing, pretty much everyone is pointing up. So. Think back to our electromagnets. When we had one wire, we got a little bit of magnetism. When we had lots of wires, all those little bits of magnetism added up, and we got a really big bit of magnetism. The same will happen in our iron. Each atom only has a little tiny bit of magnetism, but when all of the arrows, when all of the atoms line up in the same direction, all of those little bits of magnetism add up. And so overall, we end up with a magnetic field. We end up with a magnetic piece of iron. So that's iron for you. You've all successfully been iron atoms and explained why that can happen. What I have here, this lovely lump of shiny stuff here, this is a piece of chromium. Now, if you look inside, if you look inside chromium, you look at the atoms of the chromium, you will find that they also have this little bit of magnetism. The atoms are also slightly magnetic, just like iron. So what do you think will happen if I put my quite strong magnet near my piece of chromium? Any guesses? Yep. Is it going to stick to it? No, nothing happens. And that's really interesting. What that tells us is that it's not enough to look at one atom when you're thinking about magnetism. Magnetism is what we call an emergent property. You have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at it all together to really see what is going on. It's not enough to look at one atom. Emergence is a really tough concept to get sometimes, but I can guarantee that pretty much all of you will have understood it before you just might not have realized that that was what you were thinking about. I'm going to give you five seconds to tell the person next to you 
what a Mexican wave is. Okay, go. Okay. Does everyone reckon they've got it? Yes. Everyone reckons they could do a Mexican wave? Yes. yes. I think we definitely can do a Mexican wave. I think our Mexican wave is going to start on this side of the lecture theatre. OK, this side of the lecture theatre. Are you with me for this? Yes. yes. We're going to do this. We're going to send it all the way along. OK, ready? On a count of three. One, two, three, go! Yeah, come on, Mexican wave. Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. Beautiful example of a Mexican wave. OK. We're going to go back now. Right, so this side of the lecture theatre, are you with me? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to start this Mexican wave in a count of three, OK? One, two, three, go! Yeah! Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go! Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Right, now I need a volunteer somewhere in the middle you don't get to come down. I need you to stay where you are. Someone near the middle. In the sort of dark green jumper with the zip. Yep, you. I want you to do a Mexican wave. <laughs> that was perfect. I think that deserved a round of applause. Very nice. OK, so I've got a question for you. You all saw that Mexican wave, right? Which direction was that Mexican wave going? Was it going from that side to that side? Or was it going from that side to that side? You can't tell. By looking at just one person in a Mexican wave, you can't tell what it's doing. You can't tell where it's going. Mexican waves are emergent. You've got to look at the bigger picture. And it's exactly the same with magnetism. Looking at one atom won't tell you exactly what you're going to see overall. We've got to look at the bigger picture. So to actually understand what's going on inside our chromium, we are now going to be chromium atoms. OK, so I want you all to get your little arrows back out. OK, so. Last time, when we had the arrows out, what were we being? Iron. Iron is a beautiful example of ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism is what they teach you at school. Ferromagnetism is school magnetism, essentially. That's what applies to iron, to nickel, to cobalt. Ferromagnetism. What we're going to do now is anti-ferromagnetism. What I want you to do is, again, we're going to do this bit in silence. No talking. I want you to have your arrow, and I want you to point your arrow in the opposite direction to everyone around you. OK? Remember silence. How are we doing? And remember, it can only go up or down, no sideways, no forwards or backwards, no cheating. Yeah, I reckon we're doing pretty nicely here. So, let's look at the front row. You two on the end here. Overall, are you pointing up or down? Overall? Overall, yeah, the two of you together. Both or neither? Yeah, exactly. It's sort of one up, one down. What about the front row as a whole? What have we got? We've got down, up, down, up. Overall? Neither? What about, so that was looking at the front row. What about actually if we looked at the whole room? Overall, are we pointing up or down? Tell you what, on a count of three, I want you all to shout whether you're pointing up or down, okay? One, two, three. Oh. Well, I couldn't make it out. So we've got, OK, do you want to pop the arrows down for me now? So we've got half of you pointing up, half of you pointing down. So actually, overall, everything cancels out. 
got just as many pointing up as pointing down, so we end up with no magnetism overall. And that's exactly what is happening in our piece of chromium. If you were to look deep inside the chromium, you'd see that the atoms were lined up, pointing up, down, up, down, up, down. It's an anti-ferromagnet. And that means that when we put our magnet near it, overall, nothing happens. Now, ferromagnetism and anti-ferromagnetism are actually quite special. How many ferromagnetic elements are there? We've named them. What were there? Three, right? There was iron, there was nickel, there was cobalt. Um, in fact, chromium is the only anti-ferromagnetic element at room temperature. So you can see there's not many of these things. They're pretty, pretty special. It's quite unusual to look inside something and see this rigorous structure, this up, down, up, down, up, down, or up, 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 up of the atoms. If you look inside most stuff, that's not what you see. You see higgledy-piggledy atoms pointing in all different directions. Actually, you guys are a pretty good analogy for this right now. Some of you are leaning one way, some of you are leaning another way, some slouching, some sitting upright, a bit all over the place. But if I told you that someone really important, uh, let's go with the Queen, what if the Queen was coming to inspect you all? Then you could sit up straight. You could neaten, neaten your hair, tie your shoes nicely, make sure that your buttons are all done up properly. You could generally look really quite nice and neat and quite regimented and lined up and carefully done. Then when the queen wandered off again, as I'm sure she would, you'd go back to, back to looking a little bit more relaxed, back to slouching or leaning on the desk or going one way or another. That's actually what happens in most materials. I mean, it's not the queen that comes along and makes them change. It's a magnetic field. If you take a material and you bring a magnet near it, then all of the little atoms inside, all of these little bits of atomic magnetism, will all line up in a certain direction. Then you take that magnet away, and they go back to being higgledy-piggledy. And that is what I'm going to show you in the next couple of experiments. So we're going to start with paramagnetism. It's kind of like magnetism. And we're going to start with this beautiful blue crystal here. If I bring it up on the screen. There we go. Actually, I'm going to show it to a few of you. What? Does anyone know what this is? Can anyone tell me what this is? We've got a guess over there. It is copper sulfate. You got it in one. Beautiful blue crystal, copper sulfate. You might use it in chemistry classes. It's a fairly common chemical. Uh, I think it's a really beautiful blue color. And what we're going to do with it is we're going to bring it over to where my tray of water is. Over here. Now, can I have a helping hand from someone who's going to make sure that I'm not cheating? Uh, blue jacket on the end. Do you want to come on down? What's your name? Anna. Anna. I'm Catherine. Right. What we've got is we've got a piece of polystyrene foam. We've got a tray of water. I'm going to put my piece of polystyrene foam in my tray of water. And oh, I need my magnet. What did I do with my magnet? This one. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to watch really carefully. And I want you to make sure that I'm not doing anything dodgy. OK, so I'm going to put my piece of copper sulfate on there. And then I'm going to bring the magnet near it. What's happening? It's moving towards the magnet. It's moving towards the magnet. Let's see if we can get that camera a little bit better. There we go. Am I touching the magnet onto the copper sulfate? No. No. It's just moving itself across the water. There we go. Thank you very much. I'll sit back down. So, yeah, a little round of applause. So copper sulfate is a paramagnet. So when I put a magnet near it, the copper sulfate, all of the little atoms inside, line up, and they get pulled towards the magnet. So we can make the copper sulfate move by holding the magnet near it. And that's lovely. It's a lovely little demo. 
but we've got a slightly more exciting version of that. And that is going to need some fairly hardcore safety kit. Right, we've got the gloves, got to roll the sleeves down, got safety glasses, because I have got I've got something quite cool here. Literally. I've got liquid nitrogen, okay? And I am going to put liquid nitrogen in here. So, in this polystyrene case, I've got a little glass dewer, like a little glass beaker, and I've got a magnet, a very strong magnet that I'm just holding onto a stick. And we're going to have to wait for it to cool down. We might have to wait a little while. Because how cold is liquid nitrogen? Does anyone know? Yep, yeah, near the back. What do you think? Really, really cold. That is exactly the right answer. So what temperature does water freeze at? Shout out. Zero, zero degrees C, exactly. So water freezes at zero. Um, how cold is your freezer at home? It's about minus 15 to minus 20, something like that. Um, that's doing nicely. Actually, I'm going to, while we're at it, I'm going to put some in here. So your freezer's about minus 15, minus 20. On your average, on your average Antarctic day, Let's say average Antarctic winter day. What do you think is the average temperature of an Antarctic winter day? Minus is a good start. It's about minus 40, something along those lines. Then, how about the average temperature? What is, what's the, whole, the coldest temperature ever recorded outside on Earth? It's minus 80 something, it's like minus 85 or something. This stuff, liquid nitrogen, minus 196. So you've still got to keep going quite a long way. So that's why we've got the gloves and glasses, because we have to be particularly careful. Now what's the air made of? What is air made of? Right at the top back corner. Oxygen, there is oxygen in air. Does anyone know, can anyone tell me how much of the air is oxygen, roughly? I'm looking for a rough percentage. Yeah, on the end? No, it's not 2%. Does anyone know? Yeah? It's about 20%. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so about 20% of the air is oxygen. What's the rest? Yep. Yeah? Nitrogen. nitrogen. Most of the air is nitrogen, about 70%. And then, like, the rest is made up of little tiny other bits and pieces. So about 70% of the air is nitrogen. Nitrogen, oxygen, two main components. So we've got liquid nitrogen here. So we've essentially got liquid air. Um, you can make liquid oxygen from liquid nitrogen and a bit of air. So that is what we are doing right here. There's oxygen in the air. Liquid oxygen actually has a slightly higher boiling point than liquid nitrogen, which means that when I've put nitrogen into the drinks can, the oxygen is actually condensing on the side of it and then running off the bottom and dripping into my little container. I'm going to get the camera so that I can show you all exactly what it looks like. So... Can we see that? Can you see the little drips coming off the bottom? So those little drips, that's liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is incredibly flammable, which is why we're doing it on a nice metal tray, just to be on the safe side. But we're only creating tiny, tiny little amounts of it, so we'll be just fine. And liquid oxygen is very interesting. Because it's magnetic. Now, I'm going to get the, this is a magnet I've got here. It's 
I'm just going to check actually if we're doing all right. Nearly there. So I've got a magnet, I've got it on a stick so that I don't warm it up too fast. If I dip the magnet into some nitrogen and then take it back out, nothing much happens. The magnet's cold. Nothing particularly interesting to see. But what if, instead of dipping it into nitrogen, I dip it into oxygen? So, that little bit of liquid in the bottom there, you might be able to see it's very slightly blue. That little bit of liquid, that is liquid oxygen. And so it will do something slightly different when I put the magnet in it. When I put the magnet in it, and then pull the magnet back out, this time, the magnet has got oxygen all over it. So I will show you on the camera here. So that is our magnet with oxygen hanging onto the bottom of it. And the other way we can show it is if I tip this nitrogen back into the bucket and then I'm going to put this on top of here, something like that. And then if I pour, if I pour the oxygen on, you can see that the oxygen stays sitting on top of the magnet. Nitrogen doesn't do that. And that is because liquid oxygen is paramagnetic. So it ends up being attracted to the magnet. So that was our third kind of magnetism. What was the first kind of magnetism we talked about? Shout out. Ferro. Ferromagnetism. What was the second type we talked about? <laughs> Antiferromagnetism. So ferromagnetism, we have all the atoms lined up. Up, 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 up. Antiferromagnetism, they go up, down, up, down, up, down. Then the third kind was? Paramagnetism. And the fourth kind is diamagnetism. I think diamagnetism might be my favorite, because you can do some really cool stuff with diamagnetism. Right. This is just a tray of water. We don't think of water as anything particularly special. Can I have a volunteer? Someone, I need someone again to judge for me. Yeah, blue jacket on the end here. Do you want to come on down? So, water will do something kind of cool near a magnet. OK. So I'm going to put that there. I want you to check that I haven't done anything weird. There's nothing like under the table or anything strange. And I'm going to get, yeah, well checked. I'm going to get this. This box says caution, contains strong magnet. And we keep it away from everything else for good reason. This is a very strong magnet. But we need a very strong magnet because the effect I'm going to show you is quite weak. Now, which direction is your favorite? Just pick one. Way. This way. OK. So let's see if I can do this. We're going to start it in the middle, and we're going to see if we can get, this is just water, remember. We're going to see if we can use a magnet to get the water to go in your favorite direction. OK. I want you to watch really closely and make sure I'm not cheating. Wow. Any cheating there? No, no cheating. What I've done is I've moved the water in your favorite direction using just a magnet. We're going to do it again. I'm going to bring the camera over because this, I, I think this is amazing. It's just water in a magnet, but we're doing something kind of cool. So, do you want to pick a different, different favorite direction? Okay, how about this way? This way, towards me. That's going to be more tricky. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Are we up on the screen? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, go back. OK. There we go. So that's the water moving in your second favorite direction. And just to prove that this is, that there's no more, no trickery here, what I've got here is I've got 
This is an ice cube that I made earlier. Just to prove that it doesn't matter whether the water is in a pot or anything like that, we're going to see if we can do this with an ice cube. OK, I want you to pick a third favorite direction. <laughs> that way. That way, right. This one, this one is going to be tricky. Let's see. Any cheating? No. No. What we're doing is we're using a magnet to move water. There we go. Thank you very much. Should I sit back down? Thank you. That's excellent. So what we just did there was we used a magnet to move water. Because water is diamagnetic. Who's had a drink today? I have. Squash, juice, uh, milk, tea, coffee, gin. Yeah. <laughs> so all of you have probably had some water in some way or another. Who reckons they contain water? Yeah? Humans are something like 50, 60% water on average. So you've all got water in you all the time. So what would happen if I came near you with a really strong magnet? I could push you all over. I could push you all along, just like I did with the water that's here. There was an if in that sentence. The if was if I had a really strong magnet. No strong enough magnet exists, or at least no strong enough magnet with a field that doesn't sort of blow itself up exists to be able to do that to a person. In theory, yes. In practice, not right now. But we can do it to a little froggy friend. Before I show you this, I have to say, no frogs were harmed in the doing of this science. Magnetism doesn't bother animals, doesn't worry people, doesn't hurt anything or anyone. So this frog was absolutely fine. But what they did was they put a frog in a very strong magnetic field. So it's a massive electromagnet, and they turned it on. So there you go. So we might not be able to do it to people just yet, but we can do it to frogs. It's, it, it is possible. That's diamagnetism, diamagnetism of water. Now, I had to get out the really big guns to be able to show you that. I had to get out my super strong, very careful with this one kind of magnet. Because it's not a very strong effect on water. But I've got something over here which is, has got a little bit of a stronger effect. So we can maybe see it a little bit better. Can I have a volunteer? Someone who is quite good at putting one thing on top of another. What should we get? Let's go end of the road there. Yep, do you want to come on down? Right, what I want you to do is I want you to put... Actually, can you guess what this is? No. No? Okay. Can anyone... Can you see this? Can anyone guess what this is? You all own some of it. I can pretty much guarantee. Yep. It's not a magnet. This is, this is actually just a piece of graphite. Where do you all find graphite? Yep. In pencils. Pencil lead is not made of lead. Pencil lead is made of graphite. But this doesn't look like a pencil lead. This is a nice flat sheet of graphite. I want you to put that in the middle. This is a block of magnets here. I've got four magnets. One, two, three, four. I want you to put that in the middle of the block of magnets. Is it stable? It's not bad, it's not bad. Is it going to stay? Oh, it's not staying. It's pretty good, it's pretty good, but I reckon we can do better. Let's try the little one. I want you to try and put the little square on top of the little set of magnets. Did it not work? Try again. 
Try and put it right in the middle. OK, is it actually on it? Is it really, though? It doesn't look like it is. Is it, is it touching it? Have a really close look. You don't think it is? Let's see if we can see with the camera what's going on. It looks like it's hovering above it. Might be hovering, might be hovering above it. Should we see if we can show everyone exactly what's happening here? So where are we? Here. It's fallen off. There we go. I want you to just tap the top of it for me, just really gently. And what if I put my hand behind it? Then can we see? Do you want to tap the top of it again? Yeah. So there we go. Thank you very much. Do you want to sit back down? So graphite, that was graphite. Graphite is diamagnetic. It's a bit more diamagnetic than water. So it will float above a magnet. Now, again, that's not a very impressive demo, is it? I mean, it's kind of cool. You can sort of see it's floating, but it's like a couple of millimeters at best. I've got something that will do it just a little bit better. But to show you this one, I need to crack out the nitrogen again. So, gloves back on, glasses back on. And there's a jug of nitrogen. And here I've got two little black things. I'm going to put this one in the nitrogen. How cold did we say nitrogen is? Mine is 196. So that has, again, got quite a lot of cooling down to do over there. This is a piece of yttrium barium copper oxide. Um, it's kind of special stuff. We do some research on this here. Uh, you might have heard it called a superconductor. Um, and it's pretty special. But it only works when you get it really, really cold. Or at least these ones only work when you get them really, really cold. Um, we're trying to understand exactly what it is about these materials that makes them do some of the special stuff that I'll show you in just a minute. So he said it's yttrium barium copper oxide. This is actually a perfect diamagnet, which means it's going to do something quite amazing. This here, this is a set of, these are just magnets, more magnets, can you guess? These are quite strong magnets lined up on a piece of steel. How are we doing? I reckon we're just about there. So. With my piece of yttrium barium copper oxide, my perfect diamagnet, I'm going to now put it near my magnets and let's see what happens. So, this stuff is a perfect diamagnet. So, there we go. What have we had? We've had what was the first type of magnetism we talked about? Ferromagnetism, what was the second type of magnetism we talked about? Antiferromagnetism, what was the third type of magnetism we talked about? Paramagnetism, and the fourth type of magnetism we talked about? Diamagnetism. And there we go, we've finished with a perfect diamagnet. So, hopefully today I've shown you just a few of the different types of magnet fantastic. Thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>